or as I like to say, queen. All right. So King, so if like I said, if you've got last year's book, King Four is in there. Um, and obviously this year's anything before that, you won't have the new stuff. So I suggest you get either last year's or this year's. But again, background, it fits in with what we've been speaking about with the other background, how it came into being, how it kept getting updated, and and how King 3 and King 4, um, King 3 was extremely different to King 2, right? Um, because King 3 started incorporating, you know, things like IT and how, you know, prevalent that became in the business world. Whereas King 4, you, you, if you look at it, like, from a bird's eye view, it looks completely different, King 3 and King 4, right? But if you look a little bit deeper and you start reading and you look through, there's actually not that many differences. There are some, okay? But it just looks different, the way they've structured. So in King 3, there was like nine chapters and like 67 principles and whatever, and, you know, divided up into each chapter. Now there's just simply six, 17 principles, and they've got recommendations under each principle. So they've just changed like sort of the whole structure of it. But like I said, the majority of the content within, you know, those groupings is very much the same. A couple of small things here and there, which we'll go through. Um, King is long, okay? It's, it's a whole book by itself, okay? Um, so I'm going to go through it as we go, and then I'm going to summarize it in the structure and the way in which you should answer your questions in. All right. So just a bit of background because very randomly sometimes they'll ask a random theory thing about King and then you're like, geez, theory, really? Hardly ever happens, but if it does, just, you know, again, just have it in the back of your mind so it's not like completely another language. So King is all about corporate governance. Remember, King is not for auditors. It's for management, right? For people to run a business, okay? So... You need to remember, we spoke about the Code of Professional Conduct. It was for auditors and CAs in business. This is just for the business side. Can you see? It's, you need to f understand where what goes. Um, so corporate governance, the way in which the business is run. Okay. Um, it makes sure that entities run... I like the, the, the word that's quite common is sustainability, okay? They're not just thinking about money, money, money. They're saying, okay, well, let's not just think about the economic impact. Let's think about the environment, the social impact. You know, let's not hurt the oceans and the, the forests and stuff, okay? Why? Because we want the world to be able to continue for our future generations, okay? Why do we need it? Well, remember what I said, King came about and it was amended quite drastically in, during that corporate laws amendment reform. So remember the big change from King 2 to King 3 because of all those fraudulent entities that, you know, happened around in the early 2000s. Okay. <clears throat> what are the outcomes of King? And you'll see these words pop up all over the place. Ethical foundation, effective leadership, okay? Honesty, integrity, these are the types of common phrases the kings like to use. Hmm? So this was just the, the background, like I said, King 1, King 2, and then between King 2 and King 3 came the big change, right? King 4 completely replaces, whereas previously they just had add-ons, add-ons. Effective from last year, so as you can see, it's the, the new one, so they love to ask it. Um... With regards to law and compliance, if you look at how it works, King is not a law, okay? It does not replace a law. It's simply additional. Like the code, it's not a law. It's just additional, okay? So a law, you have to comply else. You're going to go to jail or pay a fine. Originally in King, they used to call it comply or explain. But they felt like comply was such a strong word. So then they decided to use the word apply. And King 3 used to be apply or explain. So you either apply what King says or you explain how you did it differently. Whereas this King is saying apply and explain. It's one little word, makes a big difference. Which means whether you followed King or not, you need to disclose it. Which means your disclosures are going to be much more than before. Um, oh, that distracted me. Um, okay, so... If I'm, say, complying with King, like 100%, for example, I still need to disclose it, like the standard 
thing. I have to disclose all of it. So there's still going to be a whole lot of disclosures. So you almost like when you come to the disclosures, you start off with the template, the basic, and then you adjust as necessary, add in here and there where you've, you know, maybe done something slightly differently or whatever. So either way, your disclosures are going to be big. Whereas previously, if you complied completely with it, you didn't really need to disclose much else. You know what I'm saying? So the disclosures are extensive. Please understand, guys, is king in the Fs? No. What does Ephraim say about king? Does it even mention? No, it doesn't even mention king. Ephraim tells us how to present the Fs. So how does king fit into this? Well, remember, when we prepare our annual reports, they're a big book. They're not, there's not only Fs in this annual report. Fs is just a small portion of that. But because it's presented with all this other stuff, which is majority of the stuff, the remainder of this book is this king stuff, because it's presented together, it's not our job to audit it. Remember, we audit the apps, so just that part. Everything else, we do have a responsibility for it, and that's why we need to know it, because we can't just leave all of that wrong and just say, yeah, the apps are perfect, and then people think, well, that must be the whole book, right? People, it's very misleading if something in the other stuff is wrong, so we need to be aware of all this other stuff that's presented with the apps, and that's why we go through it. Okay, so that's how it sort of fits in, but it doesn't necessarily affect the apps specifically. However, bear in mind, there are a lot of sections that overlap with the Companies Act, which does directly affect the apps. So you might have disclosures in your apps and elsewhere, so there's going to be overlap. All right. Which is cool, because you study them both together, and then you kind of learn one, you learn them both, eh? Very cool. All right. Apply and explain. Now, they say it's, there's no one size fits all. And that's something that the previous kings were lacking. They expected everyone to have, I don't know, this type of committee and that type of committee. Whereas now they're saying, look, if you're a tiny little entity with one person, do you really need like five different committees? Well, probably not. Maybe one person can just do the job of everything. Like really, the entity is so small, is it really necessary? So they introduced a concept called proportionality, which makes sense, right? If you're a massive entity, oh, then you need a lot of committees. If you're a tiny little entity, then maybe you don't need so many, okay? You just simply explain that it's just not relevant for your entity, which makes a lot more sense, right? Because the, like hardly anything in life is one size fits all. What are the objectives? Again, you'll see those words, ethics, responsibility, social, environment. You'll see these terms come up a lot. So just be, like I said, just going through this broadly, just be aware of the common language. <coughs> So remember what I said, it's broken up into 17 principles. So let's call those the, the little chapters, I suppose. Then each principle has a number of recommendations. So those are all the explaining what to do to achieve that, you know, chapter, that goal, okay? <clears throat> and we spoke about proportionality. And they say you can argue, like, if you've got so many, few people or if you're a tiny entity, then, you know, you can really just explain that it's just not relevant. They talk about the governing body in King. They say the governing body is responsible for, the governing body is responsible for, the governing body is responsible, i.e. the board, okay? So I talk about it as the board. The board equals the governing body, okay? Because the reason that they say governing body is because in different countries, it's got different names. They don't call, necessarily call it the board of directors in all other countries. They might call it something else. So they say the governing body of the entity. And for our purposes, it's the board of directors. Okay. The foundations of king, ethic, again, you see these words, like they shove this, they might as well control, copy and paste a thousand times this word ethics. It's all over the place, it's still the background, hey? Still the background. Ethics, effectiveness, integration, corporate citizenship, sustainability, it's all this lovely language, it's all the background. Remember, we're not only... When we talk about stakeholders, please be aware that stakeholder is not the same as shareholder. Shareholder is one of the stakeholders, yes, the main ones, but not the only ones. Okay. Integration, you can see, like, there's even a, like, we, this is what we used to have versus where we're going to, long-term sustainability, integration. Again, it's all these common words that these kings like to use, okay? And I know you're probably thinking the king is for South Africa. Yes, it is, but it's based on an international one. That's why, same as the Psycho Code of Ethics, it's based on the international code. So that's why they use 
more generic terminology because it's applicable for many. Okay, even though it's South Africa specific, but it's applicable for anyone. Okay. That's who those international people are. Hey, the inter, inter, nah, International Integrated Reporting Council. That's the international body in which King is based on. So they've got their own little, ooh, they've got their own little governance thing. And King is based on their sort of report. Okay, we're still on background. I know, right? Your, half that book is like background. Okay. <laughs> now comes Militz's weird crap. Okay. Now, this little piece of background is going to come in handy going forward. And this is actually not in King. Okay. This is from other books. They mention it in King, but it's not actually in there. It's so weird. Like, I don't understand why they didn't explain it in there, because then you could have it. So, what I try to do is try to find a nice, easy way for you to remember the things that you need to discuss. And I try to make a word out of it, and it's very hard, considering I have only one vowel. So don't judge me. You can laugh, but you'll remember it because it's stupid. And the word is schmunf. I know. Okay, I know. It's not a word, but it is now. There's only one vowel. Work with me here. And F is at the end for a reason. Okay, I'll show you now. So in King, they say, when you're reporting, when you're considering the integration, when you're considering, you know, not just the profits and the money, but all these other things, what are these other things that you're talking about? They say that you need to consider something called the six capitals. Okay, it is on the slide, but I'm just showing you a little way that I helps me to remember. So S for social, okay? Like I said, if you look on the um, slide before, it's, it's, it's all there, okay? So S for social is, you know, making sure the, you know, community around me, I'm doing, I don't know, donating books to a school, helping them make sure that they have water, I don't know, I'm not just considering myself, but I'm considering others around me as well. H, human capital, your employees, also very big stakeholders, right? I think it was Richard Branson that said, you don't need to keep your, cli your clients or your customers happy, you just need to keep your employees happy, because if you keep your employees happy, they will make sure that your customers are happy. Interesting. And we all know he's pretty successful, huh? I don't know anyone else that's got their own island. M, manufacturing, manufactured. So that's our physical assets. Obviously, I've got to make sure I'm using the correct ones, keep them updated, make sure that I'm not the environment by using them. Think about that, hey? I, intellectual, not just focusing on making money, but also finding better technological ways. So that's like your R&D, finding better ways to do things more efficiently, more effectively, less pollution, more sustainability. In, natural, okay? So don't like dump all your junk in the ocean and kill all the wildlife in there. Don't burn down the forest, but maybe replant it or, you know, feed the fish. I don't know. You get what I'm saying? And then if, okay, if obviously none of this would be possible without the finances, okay, the financial capital. Now, previously, that was always the biggest focus here. Now, I put it at the end because the financial capital is necessary because it supports all the other capitals. Without the money, you can't donate to the school. You can't feed the fish. You can't invest in R&D. So the financial capital supports the other capital. So yes, you're going to make money. I mean, that's the whole point of a business, right? But you, you, the way you use that money is now split up in, in the way that you need to consider various other factors. And that's why it's at the end, because it, as you can see, it's supporting and holding up all the other ones. And I have to put it at the end because normally it's the first thing people think of, but it's not. It's just simply what we use to support the other things that we're supposed to be thinking about. You with me? Okay, so when we talk about the six capitals, that's what this is. Happy? And then how do you increase and decrease one? You can read through that. It's quite straightforward. How it's relevant, like I said, you're going to include it in your reporting and show how you've made a difference, sustainability, all those lovely words. You're going to incorporate that within those, let's call it those headings, okay? Principles, practices, and governance outcomes, we spoke about that. The principles are the sort of chapter headings, those 17, and then the recommended practices are the explanations for each of those principles. Okay, cool. Disclosure, apply and explain. So you apply principles, so those are the 17 
headings and you explain your practices. So remember, each of those headings had stuff underneath them. You have to explain how you achieved each of those 17 goals. They tell you, they give you examples of how you can meet those goals or explain how you did it differently to meet those 17 goals. Okay, so they say, okay, well, you start with all the principles and then you, you know, use the template king disclosure and then you adjust it where necessary if you did something slightly different. And that's your full disclosure that you need to provide now. Because as you can imagine, one of the biggest changes so far was that little word from or to and making the massive world of difference in disclosures. So that's the first big difference, disclosure. And yeah, we're still in background, we're getting there. And then the outcomes we've spoken about. <clears throat> cool, you're happy with that. Now, <clears throat> we're going to go through the principles and recommended practices. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm trying to be as efficient and as make this as user-friendly as possible. Like, this is long and <clears throat> can be tedious, okay? I, I'm not... <laughs> I'm not blind. I know what people think of my subject. And I'm not saying they are entirely wrong. It's not the most thrilling thing on the planet, okay? But you know what? You do what you got to do. You make it work. And you try and make it as interesting as possible. No one likes sitting in traffic, but you got to do it. It goes here. You know, previously in ITC, all the subjects were split sort of evenly. You know, auditing is getting more and more focus. Just saying. <laughs> Not to, you know, blow my own bubble or anything. But I know it's not the most exciting thing. So what I'm going to do to try and make it better for you, I'm going to do my weird, stupid crap, try and make you laugh every now and then. I'm going to go through these 17 things briefly and quite quickly, just broadly, and then I'm going to summarize it in three areas and how we're going to structure. So you'll see each one, you'll see on your slides, there's like a... a scroll thing. I don't know what you call that. So for each one, you'll see it's got one, so it goes one and then explains, and then it's two, and then, so you're going to have 17 times like that. So I'm going to go through them briefly, quickly now, and then we're going to do the proper work where we write down and summarize and show nicely how we're going to use all this into our actual answer. Deal? Okay. So... <clears throat> The board should lead ethically and effectively. Strange words, hey, I haven't seen those before. Okay, so they have to be, um, have integrity, competence, accountability. Often I like to say that the board needs to be crafty. Competent, responsible, accountable, fair, transparent, and have integrity. So if the board is crafty, they're leading ethically and effectively. Those words are in the slides. So everything I'm telling you is in the slides. I just give you the summarized version of it in my writing. I'm not going to read through the slides. You can do that yourself. And I think we'd all be here for way too long then if I had to do that. So that's all those six there. So if the board is crafty, they can lead ethically and effectively. Huh? That's better. The board should govern the ethics in a way that supports the ethical culture. That's talking about having a code of conduct, having an appropriate method to... <laughs> communicate with everyone around us. So every time I have a contract with a supplier or a customer, I need to make sure that they're aware that this is my code of conduct. Whenever I have an employee, I need them to be aware that there's a code, I need to train them on it, I need them to be aware. I need everyone to know and communicate that there's this code and we're going to use it. And that's how I promote this culture of ethics. There's this code of ethics and everyone must apply. Okay. In a similar way, you kind of got, when you register or whatever, this letter of the code that we want to apply here, right? So it's a similar type of thing in an entity. Responsible corporate citizen, okay? Now we're saying, okay, am I considering just the F <laughs> or am I considering the whole schmidt? Yeah? Now you know what I mean when I talk weird words. So I'm not considering just the F, but the whole schmidt. Anyone confused? Just checking. Okay, if you've been following, you shouldn't be confused. Okay? Then... Strategy and performance, the board should appreciate that the core strategy and business model and sustainable are inseparable. So they're basically saying integration, one word, integration. 
So it's not just about everything is a separate thing, but we integrate this into that and we blah, blah, blah. And especially with this one comes through the disclosures we were talking about. Now remember what we said, you have to disclose everything. You can't now pick and choose only the different ones. Disclose everything. So it's not called an annual report. It's called an integrated report. Okay. And every single one of these, remember, you have to disclose. So for each one, you'll see a slide on disclosure. 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 It's the same crap all the time. What, what do they sometimes say? Okay, well, especially for the corporate citizenship one, we spoke about the six capitals and you two, you know, where you're focusing, you know, your attention. Now, they, what they do sometimes see in the disclosures, you'll see that they say, okay, well, what have we achieved this year? Because you remember, you're not going to do everything every year. What are our plans for next year? And then the following year comes, you're going to say, well, of those plans that I made for this year, did I actually achieve them? And then what do I plan for next year? So it's not just about disclosing what you did, but what you plan to do is to show that, you know, you're thinking ahead and disclosure. Okay, you with me? Okay. And that's four. Oh, the um, disclosure of the strategies and the plans. This is actually coming through. We're going to talk about this when we get to planning. The difference between the, which is something different, the audit strategy and the audit plan. But um, in the same type of context, um, the, for management, their strategy and their plan, the, the, the management strategy is the overall plan. Oh, that's a bad word. The overall uh, Way, where they want to lead the business, and the plan is a little bit more detailed of the strategy. So the strategy is the overall, and the plan is more detailed with regards to how they're going to implement that strategy. And you'll find the same thing when we get to auditing and the audit strategy and the audit plan. Okay, I'm not saying it's the same thing, I'm saying the concept of it being overall and then more detailed is the same. Okay. Then there must be Reports to the stakeholders, okay? So again, the disclosure, giving them that integrated report, making sure it's accurate and timely and everything. Sweet. Number six. So those first five were almost like overall, sort of like be ethical, corporate citizen, disclose, like everything. They were very much like broad sort of overall sections. And you'll see when I group my discussion, I'm going to group those five together, okay? Now we're talking more directly about the board itself. Remember, the governing body equals the board. Okay, The board is the focal point. So previously we said the board is the focal point and custodian of governance. Who's responsible for king? The board. Who's responsible for anything that's got to do with king? The board. Anything that's got to do with king? The board. That's the answer. <laughs> Whatever the question is about king, the answer is the board. Okay. So they are responsible. So even if they delegate something to someone, to, I don't care. The board is responsible, ultimately. Okay. So if they ask you who's ultimately the board, done. Like, don't go further, done. So that's what they're saying. They, obviously, at the top of that organization, and they have to start it there. And then whatever happens down there, it's still their responsibility. Think about what happened last year. Who got fired? The trainees? No. The ones at the top. The board. Right? Because they are ultimately responsible, aren't they? See? Practical example. We spoke about this. I'm not going to go say disclosure every time because you get it, right? Composition of the board. The key word there I want to say is balance. Balance is not only knowledge. Balance is gender. Balance is race. Balance is age. Balance is knowledge, experience. Culture, very, balance can be many things. Okay, cool. We're going to talk about the board. So remember, so we said principles one to five will group. Principles six to ten, we group. Then they talk about the composition, and you'll see this is a big one, hey? They talk about the directors and how, who needs to be on the door. But I'm going to draw you a picture, and it's going to explain all these slides in one picture. Okay, so we're not going to go through this. You have it there, like I said, for completeness purposes, but I'm going to make it a little bit user, more user-friendly for you. Committees, another topic that we're going to discuss, okay, very much integrated with Companies Act, especially for two of the committees. So in King 3, they recommended four committees. In King 4, they recommend five committees, okay. The additional one being social and ethics, which is also in line with the Companies Act, because the Companies Act only talks about audit committee and social and ethics. So King talks about those two now as well, plus their own other three, okay. So we're going to talk about that in a lot of detail. I'll summarize that for you as well. Okay, there's a lot. 
Now, they are saying that the board needs to be evaluated. Who evaluates the board? The chairman. Yeah, I'll, that'll also be in the picture. It's part of my board picture, okay? Someone needs to evaluate them. Now, previously, they just said um, it needs to be evaluated and, you know, they need to be trained and appraised and all that. Now they're saying they need to be independently evaluated every year, at least, no, no, at least every two years. And when they talk about independence of the board, they have a new rules about independence. As you know, independence is like always up in the air. So previously, I mean, someone is independent if, you know, they obviously don't have any financial interests in the entity. They're not getting paid based on, you know, how the entity is doing and all that. Now they are also saying, think about what's happening in the other legislation. They have auditor rotation and they have firm rotation for independence purposes, right? So what are they saying about the board? They're saying you can't be considered independent if you've been a director for more than nine years. Can you see how it's becoming some guy because you're too familiar, you've been there too long, you know the people. Can you see how it's similar? So now, I don't know why nine and not ten like the other, you know, I don't, don't ask me. Nine years. So what they're saying is if you want to prove that you're independent, if you've been there for longer than nine, you have to prove to me if it's been longer than nine years that you're still independent. You actually have to go far out, you know, far out and beyond to prove it. And people say, well, how do you, what do you do then? So I, well, you direct a rotation. You rotate a couple of people off for cooling off period and then come back. Same concept. You want to stay independent? You've got to be rotated. Get new, you know, fresh blood in there. Okay. So that's an additional, for exa another example of an additional thing. Independence, the nine-year rule. Okay. Remember, we're going through this just overall, and then we're going to um, do the details shortly, yeah? You're still with me. I just want you to see the big picture before we, you know, start building the puzzle. The board should ensure appointment and delegation to management. Yeah, they need to delegate. But who's still ultimately responsible, right? Yeah, the board. CEO, the chair. Then we get to sections 11 to 15, prin sorry, principles 11 to 15. This is mostly about committees, okay? They talk about each of the goal. They, they actually, they don't call these things the committees. They actually call each of the next five as um, what each committee is actually responsible for. So indirectly, they're calling these the different committees. Well, the way, that's why I like to group them with the committees, because that's what they're talking about. Yeah, they're talking about managing risk, the risk committee, right? Then they're talking about IT, the IT steering committee, yeah? Then they're talking about compliance with laws. Again, that's part of the risk committee, compliance risk, okay? And the link to your Companies Act, by the way. Then they're talking about remuneration governance, the remuneration committee. Can you see how they're kind of indirectly mentioning the different committees? So we're going to go through that shortly. Don't worry. Assurance, the audit committee. And in terms of internal audit as well, we'll talk about that within there. Then we've got the last two principles. So so what are we so so far we've gone through 15, right? So again, broadly. So we said five, five, five. So the sort of overall ones, the board ones, and then the committee ones. Can you see that? These last two, I like to shove with the first ones, the overall ones, because these last two are very much overall-y. Okay. Okay. So you can see that as, as I'm sort of explaining to you, there's going to be three sections in my discussion. There's going to be an overall section, a board section, and a committee section. Can you see that? Okay, that's where I'm leading towards this. So 16... Um, we need to make sure we consider all stakeholders, so inclusivity, so not just shareholders or not just employees. And then finally, the last one is if you are, it's talking, it's very weird, it's, a very, it's, a, it's only for specific clients, but it's talking about, it's also linked with IT a little bit, it's talking about almost like your capex, okay, what you're spending money on, is it responsible, is it reasonable, does it make sense, does it fit in line with everything? So they kind of put that in there as well, okay. And that's it. Those are the 17 principles. Okay, so overall view. Now we need to do the technique. Um, okay. 
Now, when you are asked a king question, it's often going to be a longer type of question. Yes. Ooh. Okay, hold on. Okay. So, like I said, when you have a king question, you're going to have... It's normally going to be a longer discussion type of question, and it's more often than not going to be integrated. If they integrate King with anything else, it's very likely going to be the Companies Act because of the number of similarities between the two. Okay, so I'm going to talk about King here, then I'm going to talk about Companies Act later, and then I'm going to put them all together. Remember, I said we'll integrate everything. So the first thing I do, if they ask me anything that's got to do with King or governance of an entity, I know they're talking about King, right? I'm going to break it up into three areas. The board, the committees, and it doesn't, I don't know what to call this one. I don't want to say general because it's such a bad word. I like to say ethical or overall section. Okay. So from a reference point of view, so you know what I'm sort of, you know, talking about, for the ethical overall, I'm talking about principles 1 to 5 and 16 and 17. For committees, it's pretty much 11 to 15. And for the board, it's 6 to 10. That's how I sort of group, you know, the discussion. And that's the way that it was done. That's how you'll get the most marks. Yeah, that's how they discuss it. Now... One of two things is going to happen when you get your test. You're either going to get like five pages of information, in which case people are like, oh, too much to read. It's actually better. Or you're going to get half a page of information. And then you're in trouble because <laughs> you need that information to help you fill in the apply parts. Because remember, whatever you write with regards to King, you have to be able to apply it. And with very little information, it's going to be tough. So be grateful if you've got lots of pages, because you've got a lot more to apply then. What happens though, especially come the exam, they're going to give you less and less information, which is actually worse. Okay, it's more difficult. What are the, let's call it easier, types of questions, where they tell you there's a whole bunch of stuff wrong with the board as well as with the committees? What happens if both of those are perfect and they ask you to discuss concerns with King. Now everyone's like, well, I don't have anything else to talk about. No, you've plenty. There's plenty to talk about in that other section. This ethical overall section, it's the hard section. It's the section that, oh, but the board, com the board is fine. They're all independent and stuff and there's all the committees. So I've got nothing. To you've got plenty to write. It happened in the exam and it happened in the test last year. Okay, it doesn't mean you've got nothing to write if the boards and the committees are fine. There's still plenty to write. Okay, so I'm going to do summaries for each of these three sections. Okay, but the general, you know, technique. So we're going to say, I would actually literally break up the discussion into three main headings, board, committees, and ethical. I would literally, oh, those are my first three main subheadings. And then with each, within each one, you're going to have an element of theory and an element of application. Theory, application, every time. So what does theory mean? Theory means in terms of king, please don't write principle 72 point, no. In terms of king, done. You don't need to write down the numbers. I don't know how it is in like tax and stuff. You've got to write 11 BC 2, 7 minus 2. For auditing, please don't write any numbers. It's not necessary. Don't waste your time. In terms of king, finished. Okay. And remember, you don't need to write exactly what king says. You can paraphrase. Okay. So in terms of king, they have not done this because, don't just say they have not, but because. I don't like really short sentences. I'm like, like, give me more, you know? Talk to me. Keep me listening. I want to I hear what you've got to say. Okay, more. More is more. So for each thing. So now let's talk about the board. Okay, little picture. I'm so bad at this. This is the boardroom table. At the head of the table sits who? Who runs the meeting? C CEO runs the meeting. He's the head of the table. 
I'm, this is like my little image picture thing. I'm not saying um, you might have a different view of it, but this is just the way I like and help to remember everything we need to know. So the CEO, he's the main guy. He runs the meeting. He's like, so will you tell me, what, how's your department going? How, you know, what's happening? Maybe he's the one that leads you know, the strategy and everything. In order for him to fulfill this role of knowing what everyone's doing, the ins and outs and everything, surely he's got to be executive. What does that mean? He is involved in the daily running of the business. So please understand something. I am an employee of Edge. I could be a director of Edge as well. If I was a director at Edge, I would be executive because I also work there, right? If I work at Edge and I'm a director at F&B, then I would be non-executive for F&B because I don't work there. Can you see that? Please understand that I might not be an employee, but only a director, or only an employee, or both. They are two separate things. Employment, directorship. I don't have to be an employee to be a director, and vice versa. I can be both, or one of. So an executive would be one that is also an employee. Okay. With me? So he has to work there, because he's got to know the ins and outs, he's got to know what the hell's going on. Okay. One of his, his right-hand man, okay, is the FD, the one that has to be there, FD slash CFO, okay? Now, those two are the ones that King recommends at a minimum, although if you read between the lines, they actually recommend the third one, which we'll get to now. And you know what the FD is ooh, responsible for, right? The, the Fs, pretty much, okay? So those two, obviously, the financial director is also executive, right? And then you can have however many more you want. You could have an operations director, a marketing director, strategy director, you know, social director, whatever. You can have as many as you, more as you want, as long as you've got at least those two plus one or more. Now, this third one, back to tennis. This guy is called the chairman. And he's got a funny chair. You can see he's a bit weird. I like to think of the chairman as the guy that climbs up and sits at the top of the tennis court. You know, in the middle by the net, the guy that sits there and watches what's going on. Now, <clears throat> if Serbia is playing Sweden, can I, as this umpire chairman person, be from Serbia? I am from Serbia, by the way, just saying. Can I be? Can I be refereeing that match? Why not? Because I'm going to favor Mr. Novak, won't I? Well, Dan Strader will. Or in any sport, hey, you're not allowed to have someone that's from the same... Isn't it like that in every sport? Yeah? So this chairman fulfills a similar role. He's like in the picture, obviously not in real life, in the picture he sits a little bit higher up and watches everyone. He's the one that's making sure people are doing what they're supposed to be doing. He's the one that oversees. He's the one that does the evaluations of them. He's got to watch and make sure that they're doing what... So he's sitting up in that little high up and watching. He has to be independent. Now, let's talk about independence. There's a couple of criteria that need to be met in order for me to be independent. Number one, I have to be non-executive. Why? Because if I'm an employee, I'm a stakeholder, not independent. That's not enough, though. Number two, I must have no personal <clears throat> or financial interest. Now I can just consider my code technique and I know what that would be, right? Can't have shares in the entity, can't have a loan from the entity. All those lovely things, can't have, okay? Can't rely on the entity as a supplier, customer, whatever. With me. Number three, my remuneration must not be contingent on the entity. That little sign is not equal to, yeah? Must not be contingent on the performance of the entity. What does that mean? It means I need to get paid on a fixed standard flat rate. No more, no less. So regardless of whether the company does amazingly or really bad, then I get paid the same. And number four, can you see how many criteria? Yo. And number four, if it's longer than nine years, I need to 
prove. So what I look, the rotation thing is not in King. I just say people often ask me, well, how do you maintain it? So I'm just saying, well, apply your other knowledge and rotate. So like I said, rotation is not in King. That's not what they recommend. They just simply, all King says is if you've been a director for longer than nine years, you have to disclose why you feel you're still independent. I'm giving you a practical way to address that. Do like a rotation. So if you've got nine directors, for example, rotate three or two every year or something, you know? I don't know. Yo, a lot of criteria, hey? With me? Cool. So just because I'm not executive, it doesn't automatically mean I'm independent. I have to meet every single one of these to be independent. Every one. Okay. Now, King recommends two directors, CEO and FD. They actually also require the third, which is the chair. They don't say it. They say two, but actually it's three, all right? Which actually makes sense because if you think about it, the Companies Act requires a minimum of three directors for any public entity, don't they? So it kind of works. Sweet. Now, let's talk about balance. What's a nice balance color, like blue? Remember what we said balance was? It's not just girl, boy. It's gender, race, age. You know, a lot of boards these days have um, this thing called millennials. You know what those are? Some of you might be millennials if you were born after 1990, I think. Uh, somewhere there, I don't know exactly. So the younger generation, because they've got a different way of thinking. Okay? So often, like, there's a couple of companies that I'm aware of that have millennial boards to give their opinion on certain things because of the new age of the world. So it's not just about having some old toppies in this board. You need some young, some young fresh blood. Very difficult to, they're not going to tell you the age. The only thing that they're going to tell you is, the only way you're going to know in terms of this whole gender, race, whatever thing, is if they say, Mr, 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 Mr. And there's no Mrs in there, or Miss. That's the only way you're sort of going to be able to comment on that part of the balance, okay? Other parts, unless they explicitly give you a picture of everyone or something, you're not going to be able to comment on much more than that. In theory, I'm talking about obviously, right? Happy? The other part of balance, so it's that balance which is, let's call it the demographic balance. Does that make sense to you guys? So it's got to do with the demographic balance. And it's also got to do with an independence balance. So what does King recommend? King recommends a majority. Majority, guys, is not equal to 50%. Majority is more than 50. Oh, you do understand that? So if there's eight directors on the board, that means not four, but five is majority. Are you with me? Majority, so not half, more than half, have to be non-executive. And the majority of those need to be independent. So the one part of it is the demographic balance, and the other part is the independence balance. Now, that's the easiest one. They're like 90% like of the time, that's the one in there. All the directors are executive in the examples. And you're like, well, that's bad because you need independent. Yeah, you get what I'm saying. So this is what King is recommending for the board. Let's see what else we can chat about here. Now, the king, oh, the king. <laughs> Sorry. Whew. I haven't spoken in this much in a while. Um, the king is, um, they are obviously delegating certain functions to committees, which, is, which I'm going to talk about in my next section. I just want to finish this section of here. Now, there's someone that's in my picture, obviously not in real life, sits in the corner of the room and, I don't know, takes notes and stuff. The company secretary. Now, this is a Companies Act term. However, King doesn't use the word company secretary. King uses something, they say something like, the, the, the board needs to be supported by an individual that is aware of... Um, you know, to assist them in fulfilling their duties and, you know, they can, can seek external, you know, um, consultants to assist with that or whatever the case may be. But in actual fact, in our country, because of the Companies Act, it's called the Company Secretary. Okay, so that's who they're referring to in that discussion. The Company Secretary is there to assist them to make sure that they're in compliance with this stuff. 
Um, with the committees, you'll see there's um, the performance appraisals that come through with the chairman and everything, but that I'll talk about when we get to the nomination committee. So from the board perspective, those are the main things we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the demographic balance, the independence balance, the CEO, the FD, and the chairman. That is the discussions around the board and the company secretary. Okay. Cool. Okay, so that's that's the let's call it that first that first one with regards to the board. So that's let's call that the easiest one. Okay. And that's the one it will either be there or it won't if they want to make it a more difficult question. Because that's like I mean you all know that from undergrad. I mean that's the basic stuff that you know and that's the stuff that you want to be asked to talk about anyway. The second one, the second like area or heading that I like to use is committees. Okay. Now <clears throat> from the board, these guys I don't know, they sit in meetings all day, they're so busy, but they don't even any, ever get anything done. So they delegate to committees. And now, there used to be four, there's now five committees. So <clears throat> these are my five smaller boardroom tables with three chairs because there has to be a minimum of three, doesn't there? I've put in a summary a sheet for you. I think it's at the end of your, of your King um, notes. You'll see this... Uh, it's actually in the tight letter. Duh. It's not there. Oh, it is there. Please, this I took from the tight letter. Um, it's got a little breakdown of committees. This is not, not 100% correct. Please be careful. I took it out of the tight letter, so... I'm just saying that everybody makes mistakes. We're all human, right? I'm not blaming anyone. I'm just saying, please be careful. This is straight out of the tight letter. I put it in here for two reasons. One, it's yeah, a nice summary, but two, it's also to teach you a little bit that they're not always right. Sometimes their solutions are wrong. Okay. That's why I'm here to help you make sure you get it right. So this is not 100% correct. I took it directly from the tight letter just to show you. So you can amend your summary as, as, you, as you wish, but I'm just letting you know, please be careful. Okay, so five committees. <clears throat> the most important one, the one that you should know most about, is obviously the audit committee. Yeah? We should actually put them in alphabetical order. Who's OCD? And no, I'm joking. <sighs> Nomination committee. Remuneration committee. Now I'm doing it like it's so weird. Risk committee and social and ethics committee. <laughs> it just so happened to be in alphabetical order. Sorry, it, I just it, I couldn't help it. All right. Now there are points that are relevant to all committees, and then there are points that are relevant for each one. So. We need to just be smart about how we break this down. So now the points that are relevant for all committees, so you can talk about them in general, like for anyone, at least three members. Now they don't say that specifically for all of them. They say an audit committee must have at least three and the risk committee, for example, must have at least three. They don't necessarily explicitly mention it for all of them. However, you can't have a committee. A committee is not one person. And if you've got two, you're going to have a clash, right? So you need to have the three. So it's almost common sense for the remainders that three members at a minimum, okay? That's standard. Then you need to make sure that the parties or the people within the committee have the relevant knowledge and skill to fulfill their function. So that's the little graduation hat, okay? So whatever their function is, so I'm just going to write it as well because I'm obviously very bad at drawing. So knowledge or experience in the relevant area. Okay, so experience in risk or social stuff or audits, whatever, okay? Then the other thing is that you need to meet, how often do they need to meet? Oh, that's one thing I forgot to mention about the board. Go back to your board, how often do they need to meet? Interesting, 
Interesting. Be careful. King three said quarterly. Four times a year. King four says as many times it's required to fulfill their function. That's tough, hey? So my suggestion would be, I would literally write, as per, well, King 3, it was 4, um, and they have met 6 times, and, and, and they have able to, you know, were able to do all their duties properly, so therefore 6 is fine. Or you could say, well, even though they met, you know, 10 times, they still weren't able to fulfill all their functions, so 10 was not enough. It's very tough. That four, that number four was in king three. It's not in king four. Oh, so many fours. Do you understand what I'm saying? So be careful of saying, oh, they need to meet four times a year. That's not in king four. But you can use it as like a, some sort of base, like some sort of pseudo, like random starting level if you want. But you're going to have to then say per king three then, because that's not in king four. So the, what king four says is meet as many times as required to fulfill their duties. So you can simply argue if they're not fulfilling any one of their duties, you can say they didn't meet enough, done, right? Because they're not meeting enough to fulfill their duties. For these guys, they're saying, again, King says, as many times as necessary to fulfill your duties. Previously, in King 3, they said at least two times a year. So you can use that as a base again and see if they're fulfilling their function. It's very tough because there's no number. You know, it's it's difficult to... Um, assess reasonableness when you don't know, unless they give you a lot of information about a specific committee, you won't be able to argue that point. So you can, like I said, use the two as a base, but like I said, it's not actually the number in King 4, that's it's in King 3, okay? King 4 is a lot more principle, like judgment-based, yeah? Okay. But there's an extra special requirement for the audit committee, and we'll talk about that now, now. Um, The, okay, we'll talk about membership separately. The chairman of any committee has to be independent. Why? You know what the chairman's role is, to oversee. Any umpire of any sport in the world ever has to be independent, right? Same concept. The chairman can never, ever be the same. Now, on that little summary sheet, now, they... The chair that people often say the chairman of the board can he be the chairman of another committee? Sure, but be careful. Some of them he can, some of them he can't. So he cannot. The chairman of the board, so now it's getting a little bit like if this, then this, you know, that whole. So if I am the chairman of the board, I cannot be the chairman of the audit committee. So I'm going to, I write order and cross it out so you can see that's not allowed. There was one, I think it's a risk. No, remuneration. Remuneration, social and ethics. So that means for the risk and for the nomination committee, he could be, but he doesn't have to be. He can be. It gets a little tricky. But listen, this is funny. If I'm the chairman of the board, I can't be the chairman of those committees. But then can I be a member of the committee? You can. So just be careful. Okay, be very careful when you are reading what they do and what role they fill. Okay, good. All right, now let's go to the specific committees. So for each committee, you can talk about the members and everything. So for each committee, let's talk about membership. So we said at least three, right? Now for audit, it's quite straightforward. You need, let's call Mr. Blue is independent, okay? Audit has to have three independent people, full stop the end, at, le at least. All of them have to be independent. No choice, okay? A, because King says so, and B, the company's access so, which is slightly more important. FYI, a lot of people, not a lot of people, someone, one person has asked me, you know how the company's access for a public company, there has to be a minimum of three directors, right? And then later on, they go off and say, there needs to be an audit committee with at least three members. 
in that section, in that section 94 of the Companies Act, they actually say those three audit committee members have to be over and above the original three. Which means, what they're saying is, if you're a public company, you actually need a minimum of six directors. Can you see that? Okay. So, audit committee, all blue, all independent. With me? Nomination committee. Ideally, all blue. But it can be majority, but all blue. Remuneration, all blue. These two can be a mix. So, let's say Mr. Red is executive. There has to be a mix. Okay? But regardless, the majority is still independent, right? Can you see that? Another thing that's new within King 4. On top of this original membership requirement, one of the human beings that is in the risk committee, so let's call him Mr. Green, has to be also in the audit committee. So Mr. Green is in both the audit and the risk committee. Okay? Obviously, he has to be a blue one. Why? Because he has to be independent. Why? Because the audit committee needs independent people. So in order to meet that requirement, he has to be independent. But he's going to be in both committees. Okay. Are you with me? Okay, so that's membership. Then let's talk about roles. So the audit committee, we said here about the meetings. We're going to talk about, I'm just going to, what is the purpose of the audit committee? Okay, I know it's quite a long list, actually. There's a list in Section 94 of the Companies Act, and there's a list in here. But they are, they've got a lot of duties, right? They've got to, um, like what? They've got to oversee the audit process. They've got to run the, you know, assurance model. They've got to oversee internal audit, blah, blah, fish paste. What is their main job? Their main job is to make sure that the external auditor is independent. That is their main and primary job. Now listen and think about the link between King and the Code of Professional Conduct. Have you seen the link yet? If I find that the auditors that this audit committee has approved the appointment of is not independent, can I argue that the audit committee is not fulfilling their role because of the following? And then, so, this is the situation, the principle, the th can you see the link? Now, you've got to be careful. Like, what's going to happen is, they might ask you a question to discuss corporate governance concerns. You're thinking, king, oh, this is it. But at some point, you're like, but why are they giving me so many situations in terms of the CPC when they didn't ask it? Chances are, you're going to need to write about it but you need to link it properly. You can't just start randomly writing CPC stuff. I didn't ask you for that. You tell me, number one, audit committee, blah, blah, blah. This is their role, independence of the auditor. They have not fulfilled their role because of the following. Ah. Can you see how all of a sudden you're getting CPC marks within a king question? Can you see how it can get integrated like that? So I didn't necessarily ask it, but you can see that it's there. You have to link it. You can't just randomly start talking CPC. It's weird, hey? It's like that connecting mark. You've got this whole group of marks just waiting. All you need to do is just join them together. And that's it. And then they're all yours. Okay, but we'll talk about more about integration later. So that's how we actually link King and the CPC, through the audit committee. So they've got lots of roles. They oversee the integrated report, blah, blah. Main role, make sure the external auditor is independent. Who actually appoints the auditor? Shareholders. So the audit committee actually just does the background work and the shareholders do the official, they sign the piece of paper that makes it official, really, if you think about it. Because if the audit committee recommends someone, they can 
be assured that they're independent and meet the requirements and blah, blah, okay? But the shareholders actually appoint them. Same thing goes for directors. For a public entity, they'll have a nomination committee that recommends directors and does background checks and whatever. The shareholders actually appoint at least, no, in terms of the company's public entity, at least more than half of the directors have to be appointed by the shareholders. Who approves the remuneration of the directors? <laughs> Can you see how much this is integrated with Companies Act? Again, the remuneration committee will do all the background work. They'll make the little report. At the end of the day, the shareholders need to sign and approve it. Okay. So those three committees? No. Hide. Away. <clears throat> My technical assistant just interrupted. Sorry. <clears throat> These guys do all the background work. Ultimately, though, they don't make the call. Okay. They love, they, 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 it's like one of their pet hates at UNISA when you say the audit committee appoints the auditor. It's a pet hate. They're like a negative mark if you write that. I'm joking. But you get what I'm saying. The shareholders appoint the auditor. Okay. The audit committee, yes, they do pretty much all the work. But the shareholders actually have the final word. So can you see those three committees are just, I like to call them the background work committees. Okay, so back to the audit committee. We said that they need to meet twice a year. They do also need to meet on top of that with internal audit and with external audit at least once a year without management present. Okay, to maintain independence and whatnot. Why without management? Well, that's why there's none of them are executive, hey? Cool. Nomination committee, approved directors. What's very important here with the nomination committee is um, <clears throat> when we go through the section in the Companies Act on directors, we're going to talk about directors that are disqualified or ineligible to be a director. I think it's, oi, it's I don't know the exact number. It's between sections 66 and 70. I don't know the exact, somewhere there. I'll tell you the number when we get there. Sorry, I can't remember disqualified or exempt, you obviously need to consider that because the Companies Act says you can't be a director, but you're hiring them. No. Remember, if, you do, if these nomination committees are doing the background work, they need to make sure that they meet the Companies Act requirements to be appointed in the first place. So I'm just saying that's another integrated discussion that you will have. Man, I'm just pointing it out. You need to, eventually we'll put it all together, but I'm just letting you know. Nomination committee, so you know what they do. Yeah, happy? Remuneration committee. The only, the main thing I want you to remember about the remuneration committee is that they've got two parts to their job. Number one, they need to split the remuneration between executive and non-executive. Why? What do we know about non-execs? If we want them to be independent, they need to get paid how? Fixed, flat, standard fee. Done. How should executives be remunerated? They should be remunerated per performance to align their interests with the stakeholders. Can you see the difference? It's completely different. So that's the first thing they need to do. They need to split the remuneration. Second of all, when the shareholders approve the remuneration policy, remember, shareholders can approve the remuneration policy. It must be through a special resolution within the last two years. The shareholders are not approving one thing but two things. They are approving the actual policy. Okay, the, the, this is how much I plan to pay you 10% of this, 3% of this, whatever the policy is. And number two, the shareholders are approving the implementation of. Okay, well, this was, so this is the policy, this is the document. Let's do go with Mr. Green here. Mr. Green said, he, this is how much revenue he made, this is how much work he did. So applying this policy to him, this is how much he should get. Approve the actual implementation of the policy. So it's two approvals, are you with me? The actual policy and the implementation of the policy for the directors. Are you with me? So the shareholders have two rounds of approvals. So, remuneration committee, two jobs. Number one, split exec and non-exec. Number two, have the policy and implementation for the shareholders to approve. Happy? Sweet. Risk committee. Now, the risk committee, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a sub-sub committee. Three, I'm going to have a compliance 
risk committee. I'm going to have an IT risk committee. And I'm going to have a, the, the remaining risk committee. God, the reason that I split it up is because they mention as a separate principle compliance with laws and IT because it's so prevalent in this day and age, right? So compliance committee. What is compliance risk? Compliance risk is the risk that we do not comply with all laws and regulations. Enter the company secretary. Remember, if you well remember from way back when when you did Companies Act, the company secretary's main role is to make sure the directors are complying with all the laws and regulations, not only the Companies Act. So the company secretary will play quite a big role in the compliance committee. And that is your link to the Companies Act, by the way. How do you link King and Companies Act? Well, King says you need to comply with all laws. Companies Act says you need to maintain good governance of your entity. And they have just become one. Huh? Cool, huh? That was the puzzle piece connect, the bridge. IT, they, they, I like to call it an IT risk committee, but they, in, you know, more correctly, they call it the IT steering committee. I don't know, the IT geeks think they're cool if they can drive. I don't know. So steering committee. And what do they do? They talk about IT risks. Okay, we're going to talk more about risks next test. But IT risks, hacking, viruses, losing information, specific to IT. Okay, they deal with IT risks and how to respond to them. And the, the remaining risks. So that could be financial statement risks, in which case that Mr. Green is going to play a part in that one, isn't he? Because remember, all audit risks are business risks, but not all business risks are audit risks. Well, we got a lot of those weird ones, eh? It's like a riddle. You got to figure it out. Okay. We're almost done. Let's finish this, and then we can have a nice lunch. No, we've just got companies that left. It's not small, though, so just the same. Anyway. Um, and then the Social and Ethics Committee. Now, for a long time, I was reading up about this and trying to figure out what is the purpose of this committee. Essentially, what I've come to conclude, reading between the lines, social and ethics. What, where, where are those terms common? Where have you heard those, like, a lot? King. So what is this committee? They're there to make sure the entity complies with King, pretty much. So reading between the lines, I could argue and say, well, if there's any non-compliance with King, I'm going to say, well, the Social and Ethics Committee didn't appropriately fulfill their function. Right? So yeah, the, 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 their description and their purpose is very weird. Okay. But like I said, it's my conclusion <laughs> through my assessment is that they're there to make sure that all the governance and ethical requirements are being met essentially in the entity. So compliance with King, pretty much. Okay. Yo. So committees, essentially, what do we have? We've got number of members. We've got membership requirements in terms of blues and reds and greens, yeah? We've got knowledge and experience requirements, graduation hats, obviously in the relevant fields, yeah? We've got meetings per year, remember the difference between King 3 and King 4, and then the extra special one for the audit committee. Then we've got the chairman for each committee. Then we've got the purpose for each committee. So for each committee, you can see that there's quite a lot to talk about. Now, when you get a question, it is highly unlikely that you're going to need to talk about all five committees. So what does that mean? It means that you might only talk about one or two of them, and that's fine. There's, we have two things that can happen. Either they're not going to give you any information about any committees at all. So how are you going to apply if you don't have any information? You can't. All I would say then for this sort of heading committees, I would simply say there is no indication of the recommended committees per king, and those are, and I'll just mention the names of the committee. And that's so one point just to mention that I've considered it. But please don't write more because, guys, there's no point in writing all this stuff if you can't apply it. If you don't have information in that question to be able to apply each of these, don't write it. If then they say give you information about the audit and say remuneration committee, then you talk about audit committee, boom, boom, boom. Then you talk about remuneration committee, boom, boom. The stuff that is the same, three members, for example, for both audits. So you're going to have three headings. You're going to have audit committee heading, remuneration committee heading, for both committees heading. 
Why? Because you're not going to write the same thing twice, hey? Do you see what I'm talking about? Are you with me? Then, if I've only got information to apply, audits and remuneration, for example, I would mention as one comment, there is no mention of the other committees that King recommends, for example, nomination risk, and so forth, just as one comment, just to show that I'm aware that there are others. I'm not going to write more on them because I don't have anything to apply. Are you with me? Okay. And that's what's most likely going to happen. You'll be writing about one or two. Audit will probably be one of them. Okay. The one thing I didn't mention yet was internal audit. I mentioned them that the audit committee oversees them, but just a little bit more on internal audit. You guys are managing. We can do this. We can finish it. Woo! Let's finish it. Come on. Inter we're almost done with King. Okay, let's just finish it. Internal audits. You know the difference between internal and external audit, yes? Internal audit works for management. Their main purpose being effective controls in the entity, risks, management, and governance as well. So they're also quite linked there. Audit committee oversees them. Why? Internal audit must report to an independent audit committee. I'm not going to report bad stuff that I find in the company to my direct boss. <laughs> Jeez. That would be dumb. So or internal audit must report to audit committee. Their head is called the CAE, Chief Audit Executive. He's not a director. So there's no little boardroom table for them. He's just a senior manager. Okay? He's the head of the department and he runs his staff and they all report to the audit committee. Okay? So audit committee. So it's not too much about them. There's just one thing that is different from King 3 to King 4 with regards to internal audit. Now, internal audit, let's pretend that they are the ones that monitor and oversee, you know, the rest of the guys in the organization, right? To make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're the ones that walk around, they're like Professor Umbridge, you know, walking around with their clipboard and watching everyone, yeah? But King 4 introduced something that said, well, who's monitoring the internal audit? So they're monitoring everyone else, but who's monitoring them? Ah, <laughs> who's monitoring the monitor? Okay, it's not funny. Okay, I get it. Um, so they, King 4 now says that at least once every two years, they have to be independently monitored as well. On top of, so they're monitoring everyone else, but once every two years, they also need to be monitored. Okay, so that's something new as well. Okay, and that's committees done. Happy? Those are the two big ones. Now, ethical and overall, the section that everyone always forgets, it's like in ethics, that section three and five in my little steps, it's always the one people forget. Unfortunately, it's always the one with the most marks, isn't it? Because let's be honest, those first two were straightforward, the, uh, I don't know, undergrad type of almost stuff, yeah? Now, our ethical and overall, <clears throat> is the rest. Now, I'm just going to give you a list of things here because it's not like I can group it or picture it, you know, draw a picture. So I'm just going to give you points to consider here. And then, um, obviously, you need to apply each one. So if you're going to write one, you need to make sure you can apply it. Okay. You can't just write these. So we want to make sure that the entity acts ethically and effectively. Obviously, you are all aware you need to write in full sentences, yes. I'm just writing on here, short form, just, just checking. Just making that clear in case. And then you can apply you the way you can apply is through the crafty. Yeah, remember that? Sweet. Number two, they need to be um, have an ethical culture. Then you can apply that through whether there's a code of ethics in the entity. Like their own firm little ethical code. Number three, we can talk about the whole responsible corporate citizen. Like, I don't know, they're polluting the, the water or whatever. And to apply that, you can use... I'm just going to... It's not necessarily the F, so I'm putting Schmidt for you so you know what I'm talking about, but I'm going to cross out the F because we're not talking about that with regards to corporate citizenship. We're talking about the others. Does that make sense? 
money is like inherently there. Okay. Then we can talk about the integrated report. Integrated. Oh, that's a long word. Such an integrated word. <laughs> um, and then, you know, are they making all the disclosures that they need to? You can, you can link and apply and explain all the disclosures. Then we can talk about stakeholder inclusivity. Are they considering inclusivity? I don't want to spell it wrong and write what I'm saying instead of what I'm meaning to write. And I'm just going to write the stakeholder versus shareholder. Are they considering all the you know different stakeholders versus just the one group? If they don't, if you don't specifically talk about a risk committee, in which case you mention compliance, I would uh, mention compliance with laws and regulations over here. Okay. If there's any law that's not being complied with, you can mention that King is then also not being complied with. Why? Because King says comply with laws. So if you're not complying with the law, you're also not complying with King. So I'm going to say link to Companies Act. Like I said, it'll all make more sense when we've done them all and integrated. Then we can talk about the company secretary. That's also the link to the laws as well as the Companies Act. Okay. What was 16 again? Forgot now. Yeah, I did that, did that. I think. Okay, I think that's. I think that's it for now. If I think of more, when we do the Companies Act, it's also got an overall section. We'll talk about them together because they're quite similar. And then I might add to this one later. Okay, cool. So essentially three sections, board, committees, ethical, and overall. Sometimes all you've got to write is this ethical overall. Okay. Yes. Shh. That was awkward. Alrighty. It is, let me just save this.